Welcome to the Humans Outside Podcast, where we are building a life around getting outdoors through learning from fascinating outside-minded guests. I'm Amy Bouchot, a journalist originally from the beach in California, now working to love nature from my home in Alaska. Since September 2017, I've spent at least 20 consecutive minutes outside every single day, no matter the weather. On this show, we hear from others who make heading into nature just a part of who they are while we work to do the same. If you love what we do, you can support Humans Outside on Patreon or leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Ready for the good stuff? Let's go. Max Romy is a person in motion. I usually start our episodes trying to capture my guests by describing who they are or what they do. But when I was trying to figure out how to introduce Max to you all, I had a lot of trouble. He's an artist who paints stunning watercolors of mountains and ridges worldwide, often while on top of the mountain he's sketching, which means he had to get there first. He's a filmmaker who specializes in capturing athletes, particularly trail and ultra runners, as they do their thing. He's a runner himself, and not just because he has to keep up with the people he's filming, but because, like I said, Max is a person in motion. But my favorite thing about today's incredible guest is that he's a storyteller, pairing watercolor with film and often running to bring mountainscapes and the people who love them to life in a way that really defies words. Seeing his art is like physically stepping into a painting. Today, we're going to talk about heading outside to find a life in living color, but how getting out there unlocks who we are. Max, welcome to the Humans Outside podcast. Thanks so much. Super glad to be here. So, okay, so we like to imagine ourselves hanging out in our guest's favorite outdoor space when we are talking to them. Um, I can't imagine that you have, you know, like only a few of those. I'm sure you have a lot. Um, What is yours and where are we talking with you today? I think my go-to outdoor place is up on a ridge called Little O'Malley. And it's just a quick hike from Glen Alps. And it kind of goes up this gully on this new trail and... It's got just enough of a hike where you feel like you got somewhere pretty, like pretty high and you're looking over and there's Anchorage in the background and there's Big O'Malley and it's a little bit stormy and it feels like you could just go anywhere and you have gotten out of the city and you're in Middle Earth finally. And that's, uh, that's kind of my go-to hike. So we're, we're going to hang out right there in the saddle. Awesome. I've been up there and it is a beautiful, beautiful place. So um, lots of beautiful places here in Alaska. It's hard to pick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Okay, so tell us, how did you become a person who likes to go outside? I think that it started when I was kind of bundled up like a sleeping bag with my parents. Uh, They were really good at getting us out, whether we wanted to or not. And looking back at the photo albums, there's, you know, just like the little face in the backpack was me a lot of the time. And I remember just always being outside and... I don't remember when I wanted to become a person outside though, because as a little kid, I just remember being dragged into the car on a Saturday afternoon and just kicking and screaming the entire way to the trailhead, not wanting to go. I wanted to like stay in and watch TV or something. And then the second the car door opened and we were outside, I was loving it and didn't want to go home. And then I guess at some point I grew up a little bit and then I was the one who had put myself in the car kicking and screaming because I didn't want to go out for a run and drag myself to a trailhead. And I still love it all the way home. So that, I mean, it isn't that just how life goes, you know, like my son does something very similar and, and now as an adult, I have this habit where I go outside 20 minutes every day and some days are better than others. And I make my, there are definitely days that I make myself go. And then there are always days that I don't want to come back inside. Yeah. Well, I've heard this this phrase. It's called like the doorstep mile. Um, my friend Stian Angermundvik, uh, who's who's a runner in Norway, has like the Norwegian word for it. And it's great. Um, very guttural. But like it's the idea that it's like the first mile of any run or walk or hike is getting out the door. And it's funny because it's like I love being outside, but I feel like that, you know, that inner eight year old is always there where it's like, I don't want to do this. Like, why? And if somebody else gets me out there, it's easy. But for me to actually get out of the door is so tough for some reason still. And 
I just, I need to remind myself that it's like, all right, this is a common enough thing that there's a Norwegian phrase about it. So like, yeah. you're not alone. Other people struggle with this. Like, get out the door. It'll be fine. And then once you're there, it's easy. But they say the only run you regret is the one you don't take. And I, you know, that's, that's like specific to running, but I think that's true for any kind of outdoor stuff. Like the only outdoor time you regret is the outdoor time you did not have. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, even so. the bad ones. What the, I feel like there's another Norwegian term for that. Of like, yeah, being outside <laughs> when it's just miserable. Like, I, like, yeah, that makes you feel like an adventure. Like, you can't lose. Although, I guess yeah. you could like lose a finger or something. But even <laughs> then, it's a good story. Fair enough. <laughs> you and I are both storytellers in our own way, so I I can't help but agree with you on that. <laughs> um, you know, I like anytime there's like disaster, I'm like, well, that'll make a good blog post. Like. <laughs> <laughs> basically you're gonna have a good time or a good story and it's the same for you know out getting outdoors making a painting like yeah. telling a film like yeah it's kind of insurance storytelling I, is insurance for life <laughs> it absolutely is i have uh, um we have humans outside supporters on patreon and one of the patreon bonuses is uh a episode entirely devoted to Amy's outdoor fails, like stories of me doing something disastrous and someone else on, like joining me in this episode to talk about my embarrassment. So <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a good, like, I feel like some of the best stories and it's the same with watercolors too. Like, I mean, it's not as embarrassing. Usually it's kind of horrifying, but like, I would say probably my favorite paintings I've ever made often either start or end with just a massive mistake where you're just like, oh, I wish I did not do that. And then it turns into something beautiful. And and uh, I feel like life and especially getting outside is usually the same way. So that's a great segue to describe the kind of art you do. I, I feel like when I look at your art, it's um, very similar to the Mary Poppins scene where they step into the chalk artwork um, and all of a sudden they're in this other world. That's how I feel when I view your paintings. Um, can you describe them for us though how you marry um watercolor and video because I, I think it's just something that can be hard to visualize so how do you yeah that's a good question i mean that's certainly what it feels like a little bit with mary pop and stepping into kind of that chalk world i i really like the intersection of watercolors and what it took to make them and i have always been painting since I was a little kid. And I am recently, I guess 10 years is recent into like videography and photography. But um, for me, like my first real language is watercolor. I think my grandmother was an incredible adventurer and watercolorist. And as a little kid, I just spent so much time just like flipping through her sketchbooks. Um, I couldn't read very well, but like I could flip through these and just like get them and kind of fall into that world. And I kind of want to reverse engineer that a little bit for other people to have that experience. So what I often do is I'll make a painting that fits perfectly into the landscape like a puzzle piece. So that way you can just, you can see where it came from. You don't just see the beautiful picture because the world is full of beautiful pictures, but you can kind of see that connection of the artwork into the landscape. And hopefully if I do my job right, you can even see the connection of yourself into the landscape as well. So I'm still playing around with it. Uh, I so often feel that whether it's a film or a painting, uh, you should create the artwork that you don't see mm. that you would want to. And I've had a really good time making the paintings that, that I would like to see, but I feel like there's so much more. I want to see paintings that I want to see somebody be able to walk into a world of watercolor and the way that an artist can see it. And I want to see, I want to see paintings that kind of explain and and diagram stuff that doesn't exist or maybe it's really hard to describe. So uh, whether it's a time lapse or a, 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 a painting puzzle piece that fits in, uh, I've been posting a lot, but I, I feel like there's just a whole world to explore in there. And I'm so excited to see where it leads. Was there like an aha moment that uh, where you realized that this this marriage of the film and the watercolor was going to unlock something for you? Um where they met like that? Oh, that's a really good question. I think I think it was one of those accidents, to be honest. Like, I think, boy, that's a really good question. I think I never saw painting as something that was viable. Mm -hmm. I I love from an painting. economic standpoint. 
Well, honestly, from like a from like a artistic standpoint, mm. I mean, I, I was I was working with Solomon pretty pretty quick off. Like I've always been painting; it's just kind of been like a little side thing. I, I love to do it, but it's it's very much been just something I do on my own. And I thought kind of film was where it's at. Like I from college, I was working with um, a company called Run Gum, and then I switched over to a company called Solomon. And it was really cool. And I was getting a lot of feedback of these really neat videos. I mean, I was being flown around the world to run with some of like the coolest, fastest people and capture their story. And it was great. And I would always be painting on the side and just like, you know, like giving little paintings as gifts and everything. And it was fun. But that was really just for me. And then I think once I was like waiting for somebody on a mountaintop, like I'm just sketching. I would have a sketch as one with does. me. As one does. Yeah. Well, I mean, like painting used to be a big thing. We're just watching, a, what is it, Victoria on Netflix yeah. right now. And the queen yeah. is just like, you know, sketching all the time. And I was like, wow, she's so artistic. But like back in the day, that's just, that was just like a part of like life. You know, you would, you would paint in the same way you, you would write. It was a way to capture the world and communicate with others. And um, I'm really lucky that I've been encouraged to. And people give up on it a lot because if you paint until you're nine years old and then you stop for 10 years and then you start again, you're basically painting at a nine year old level and people are embarrassed and they don't they don't want to show anybody and they don't want to continue because it looks like a nine year old painted that because that was kind of when you stopped. Um, but I think what people don't realize is that if you keep on doing it for a week, two weeks, three weeks, like it gets good quick. And then you just keep that up little by little. And uh, you know, you become a very good painter very quick, but I was thinking I was sketching on top of one of these mountains and I took a picture of like a mediocre sketch with a mediocre camera and it became a very good picture. It was a better mm -hmm. picture than it was. Let's see, that picture was a better picture than the sketch and a better picture than just the landscape picture. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, that's really cool. Like that kind of gets it. And uh, and then all of a sudden, like that kind of happy mistake just led to more and more and more and more. And when you repeat something, you just get better and better at it. And so, um, yeah, now I've kind of like stumbled into this and I actually recently kind of left that sort of, career of filming with uh you know solomon and sort of these like large scale just just running events and i'm really diving into this kind of sketching painting thing and it is so cool like yeah mistakes they lead you to some of the coolest places and then you get lost and then finding your way back out is where you know life happens yeah so uh we talked a little bit before we started recording about <laughs> how you, about how you sort of find your place in the world. Um, I know you deal with dyslexia um, and that that's had a pretty big impact on how you ended up doing what you do. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think dyslexia is often pretty misunderstood. I know um, there's a lot of very famous dyslexics out there. Uh, Walt Disney was dyslexic. Harrison Ford was so dyslexic, he couldn't read the script. So somebody would have to record it for him and he'd listen to it again and again before, uh, you know, filming Lord, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark with Indiana Jones or even Star Wars. So there's dyslexics all over the place. And what it does is it, it makes it more difficult to comprehend reading and writing. And you can still see perfectly fine, your eyes work. It's just the information kind of gets jumbled up inside of your brain. You know, you have all these senses and then your brain kind of puts them together. And for dyslexics, your brain is literally rewired. I mean, like your left, your left side does something with your right side. I don't know. It's something with like how it's all wired up in there. Like, obviously I didn't go into to neuroscience, but uh, one of, one of the effects of that is that you, like left and right is very difficult. Um, that's when everybody says, Oh, dyslexia, it's B's and D's. It's, it's not really, it's just kind of your, your information is getting sent all over the place. And so reading and writing is a little bit more difficult, um, e like for comprehending, even though somebody reads it to me out loud, I get it instantly. It also means that lefts and rights are pretty difficult. People always say like, you can do the, you hold your fingers out and you have an L, the left hand makes the L. But for me, I just see two L's because I can't really like tell that apart very well. It takes me like a few minutes. Um, and and so growing up, what that does is it really kind of can throw you for a loop. So if you are like dyslexic, or maybe if you have a kid who's dyslexic and struggling with that, what it is, is it just makes uh, realistically middle school and high school a little bit more difficult. All these other kids are learning how to read and they're just picking it up really quick. And so for me, it just took a really long time and I was good at faking it. 
it made me really good at like BSing everything. Basically, I could, you know, I could fake read, I could listen to somebody else read the passage and then basically copy them. Um, I, I would kind of hide it, I would like spell check everything. And I was pretty good at hiding a lot of this, but then on tests and everything would come out and it sort of fall back. And my mom was really good at kind of picking that up. And she's like, all right, we see what's happening. We're going to get you a little extra time. We're going to be a good advocate for you. And so in addition to like all the extra help that she was able to give me, uh, she really encouraged me in the artistic side of things. My whole family did. And for me, watercolors kind of became this refuge because I was falling behind in everything uh, aside from basically art. I, I whether no matter what subject it was, writing an essay was was going to be brutal and terrible, and I wasn't going to be able to do it well because even though I had all these stories stuck in my brain, uh, I couldn't get them out on paper without somebody being like, "You misspelled ninety percent of the words here." Like it is just it like written in red text from all the underlining basically on the computer, and so it was just this big struggle. Um, like English wasn't. English is both my first and my second language, basically, and I still haven't gotten either. And uh, and so watercolor was just this thing that I could do and I would get it instantly. You, know, you can't misspell a painting. It was amazing. And so for me as a kid, I really just gravitated toward anything creative because it was this even playing field. Both athletics, watercolor, and kind of being outside were places as sort of safe from words. And even today i mean my biggest nemesis is emails it takes me maybe four or five times as long to write and read emails and even then it's it's pretty rough but uh i'm comfortable in some of these places they're they're little ref refuges for me so okay you just said that you know you listed three things running um watercolor and being outside that were refugees. So I think it's really interesting that you've now created a career out of like the marriage of those three with a side of video. Yeah, well, a lot of the the success that I've seen in life happens in the intersections. If you want to be the best speed skater in the world, that's a great pursuit. And you can put your entire life and then perhaps if you're very lucky, you'll become the best speed, speed skater in the world, you know, after just working harder than everybody else for a very small amount of time until somebody else becomes faster than you. But if you want to become the best, you know, speed skating, watercolor videographer in the world, that's much, much, much easier because that's just a Venn diagram that creates a color that very few people have seen. I mean, it sounds pretty dangerous too, by the way, like. <laughs> oh, I, I honestly, I would totally go for it. I recently did a couple of paintings in a helicopter and I'm hooked. Like, I think ah. that like taking paintings places is wild. But like, it's the same for anything. I mean, like, if you just focus on one thing, you're you're one in, in uh, you know, maybe a billion, if there's mm -hmm. a billion people that do that. But as soon as you focus on two things, all of a sudden you're maybe one in a million. And you focus on three things and combine those, now you're one in maybe a thousand. And so for me, uh, being able to use these tools uh, really allowed me to kind of do things that I'd never seen done and, and really give a lot of confidence to a kid that was struggling heavily to basically communicate with the outside world. And so it was really awesome to be able to find kind of my own thing and, and kind of realize too that that you don't have to be the best in the world. You can, you can really be very unique very quickly by just... Uh, by seeing the things you love to do and, and mixing them. And, uh, you know, maybe you're not the best in the world, but who cares? You're doing three things that you love to do. So for me, yeah, the filmmaking, the watercolor, the, the being outside has been this awesome skeleton key that's kind of unlocked all these opportunities in life. But right now I'm just excited for like, how many more ingredients can I add to this? Like, how, how can I make this even more different to bring more people in and get them excited about these things? Okay, so two things you just said. First, you said uh, you talked about unlocking who you are, and I'm wondering, and unlocking that creativity. And I'm wondering what uh, what part of that is tied to being outside. Like, does heading into nature have a role to play in unlocking that, or is that something that you can unlock in the same way by being a person who spends a lot of the time inside instead? That's a good question. Oftentimes, I do find myself going into nature to seek out creativity. It, it draws me there. And to be honest, there's nothing we can do that will be more wild and surprising than what we can find outside. 
all you have to do is like look into nature and you'll find all the inspiration for the wildest, craziest dreams that you never even thought of. Maybe it'll be on a different scale, but even just like horror films and alien movies. I mean, all they do is they're basically like, what is the scariest thing we can create? And they go into their garden and they find a praying mantis and they're like, all right, we'll make this 10 times larger. There we go. That's, that's scarier than anything anybody can like conceive of. But it's the same with inspiration too. I mean, to go outside, it kind of hits something that's deep. It's like, it's like living in Alaska, you know, who, when you're here, when I first moved up here when I was 16, it just felt like home. And I'm not sure why it just something clicked. And I feel like it kind of be the same in your brain, you get out there. And ideas for me just happen. Oftentimes, I'll kind of have all these pieces maybe in my normal life, but only once I go on a run out in the mountains, do they kind of like all fall into place. And uh, I feel enormously lucky that that I live where I do, and that I've been encouraged to get outside because who knows who I'd be without without these big places but yeah i think creativity is creativity is something that you find in your own head but only when you fill your head with the beautiful things that you can find outside uh the other thing you said was you talked about that intersection and adding layers to that do you think there are infinite layers i've heard that the amount of chess moves that you can do on a single chessboard with, you know, after watching the queen's gambit, like I'm sure everybody's like, okay, chessboards, right. I think it's, you know, <laughs> like what, 20, 24 squares or something. Or maybe it's like 48 squares and then, you know, 18 pieces or something. And the amount of chess moves that you can do on one of those boards is a number so large that if you made a move per second, it would take in the billions of years to do all the moves, something huge like that. And if you think about that with those 48, or, you know, however many numbers, I should actually look that up probably. But if you think about that with that limited like board that you can hold in your hand, and then you think of like how big the world is and how many things there are, there are an infinite amount of things that you can add to what you're doing to make you unique and to have those combinations. It can feel kind of overwhelming, especially in the outdoor world to kind of feel like you could stand out because every single day, it seems like somebody else broke some record of maybe something that you're working on, you know, Killian Jarnett like runs up Everest in 27 hours. So it's like, all right, cool. Check that one off. No way. I'm going to like, you know, do anything remotely, you know, stand out ish in like the mountain running side of things or perhaps in watercolors. All you need to do is look on Instagram and you'll see like a thousand artists that are better than you. You know, it's, it's absolutely just staggeringly, uh depressing sometimes <laughs> just in that it just it just depresses you down it just pushes you down like how much how much success there is and then how small you can feel but in the same way all it takes is just to add a few tiny extra things and then all of a sudden you're in a world all to yourself and it's a little bit like hiking out in alaska i mean yeah you can you can stand on these huge big trails and it's great but then all you need to do is take like one or two single tracks and then maybe a moose path and you're somewhere nobody's been for a thousand years and uh and i feel like the outdoors kind of remind you of that when you get up there you might feel like all of these people are doing these big wild things and you get on top of a mountain and you realize like how much possibility there is and then how small you are and what a freeing thing that can be I'm so glad you said that because I was just thinking that exact same thing when you, you know, like it, it's so you can feel like, like the man is keeping you down, right. It, due to like the excellence of so many other people. And, and as you said that, like, that's exactly what I pictured, like this moment where um, you're on top of a mountain or in a wild place, maybe if you're not in Alaska, where you feel that sense of, it's like both this sense of like absolute exhilaration like you just described and it's very humbling like i'm a i am but a small cog in this wheel <laughs> but what a wheel i mean it's yeah. just it's so cool and 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 it is tough because it's yeah it, it can really with the advent of social media it can really feel like like nothing you can do will be nearly as cool as what all these people do and uh and and that's something I still feel on a daily basis. And I kind of feel like the mountains are sort of medicine to that in a lot of ways. They, they don't care what you do. Like, you know, you're just part of them regardless. They're so much bigger and older than you'll ever be. And so you may as well go for a hike and then come back with that renewed sense of perspective and do what you want to do anyway. Because, you know, you're just like a, you're not even a, a fly to them. And so you may as well enjoy your tiny little fly life to its fullest. 
I, but I love that you, I love that perspective that you have, like that, uh, that you, you feel like that when you look at social media, because when I look at your videos, I think, man, nothing I do will ever be as cool as this. So it's nice to know that we all feel that way. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no, no. Don't worry. Like, like, yeah, it's like, I remember, cause I think I've got like on Instagram, it's like 11,000 followers. And I remember being at, you know, nine or like 1000 or even like a hundred. And it was kind of like, boy, if I got a 10,000 followers, I would be happy. Like that, that is happy. If I have a thousand followers, like that is happiness. And like social media is not the answer. I mean, you, I have friends who have hundreds of thousands of followers and they abhor social media. And so like, it's a great tool. It helps you connect to really cool people and really cool ideas. But the, the truth and like, you know, the actual, the actual happiness is found with those people and in those places, not not on the social media that you know that gives you a couple fake internet points for posting about them hey humans if there's one thing i value it's time management you've heard me talk about it over and over again i'm basically obsessed figuring out how to get the most out of my day lets me spend time on the stuff i think is important like going outside so when it came to making sure Humans Outside was good to go from a business standpoint, I knew I was in way over my head. That's why I hit up attorney Rachel Brinke and her boutique law firm, Eden Law, for help. If you've got a business, you've got to be thinking about trademark and copyright stuff. Rachel and Eden Law will save you time and money, just like they did for me by going through your needs or case as part of a free consultation and then setting you up with a path forward. Eden Law specializes in working with business entrepreneurs just like you and me. Head over to eden-law.com to check out how they can help you protect your hard work through one of their packages. Now, back to the show. So you were nonstop world travel guy before the pandemic. Um, and you mentioned no longer working on the, you know, shifting careers. But I, if I... If I understand correctly, that's sort of like pandemic driven, you know, like, well, we're not traveling, so we're not traveling. Um, <laughs> what has what pandemic life taught you about stories and about how we interact with our world? Just because you're you're here doing that, that work. That's now. A good question. Yeah, well, I guess the, the main difference is that I'm in my own bedroom doing this, uh, you know, <laughs> talking, talking somewhere familiar, which is kind of great. Um, I actually decided to step away from the global travel stuff about a month before the pandemic. Oh, which is, well which was good. it was, <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, and I think if anything, it's kind of been a little bit of a reminder that, that following your own path uh, can actually be a really, a really safe bet. Yeah. You can always do the safe thing of following the big fancy job that's well-paid has benefits and they send you free gear but if you are willing to kind of chase down what feels right and mm. you stick with it, like the, the rewards are infinite. And so I had this moment in, uh, oh boy, I guess it was like a month before the pandemic happened, where it's basically this choice of doing this big project in Alaska or continuing and doing the big global stuff uh, all around the world. And I was really pushing for this Alaska project and it basically got shot down because, you know, Alaska is this one tiny place. And then, you know, they're, they're going to focus on the big, the big wide world. They, they got to chase down all the big stuff in the wide world. And I had this suspicion that if you spent a year in Alaska or honestly, even just a year at home and you just dug down, you would find stories that nobody had ever heard of. Instead of chasing down and retelling the stories that everybody knows, you'd be able to find new ones that are absolutely incredible. And so that was the plan is basically uh, we were going to start in Seward on July 4th, um, which didn't happen this year, and film Mount Marathon and just kind of see what happened, see where it took. And so for the first time in, you know, I guess the second time uh, in a year and then like the 10th time in 100 years, this race is canceled. And following interviews, we ended up just kind of following this trail called the, the um, what is it? The Historic Iditarod Trail? Yeah, well, it's kind of like a big, it's INHT, let's see, International, no, Iditarod National Historic Trail. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And we ended up following this to kind of see where it leads. And it's like, these stories are incredible. And it's absolutely just mind bogglingly wild what you can find just like in these places and these roads and these trails that you've been on 
10, 15, 20 times uh, when you actually stop and ask. And it's not because the stories aren't wild, the fact that you're not hearing them. It's it's not that they're, you know, not absolutely just like on par with all the other wild stuff you see documentaries about. It's just that nobody's taken time to kind of dust them off and look at them right. And so uh, this March, hopefully, I'll be heading up to Nome to kind of complete that by foot and uh and then using watercolor and these kind of new techniques that we were talking about to kind of try to combine all of this like some weird combination of like a ken burns documentary reading rainbow and like red bull tv so yeah i'm excited i want to back up a little bit and describe it's like explain what you just described for people who aren't in alaska so Mm -hmm. mount marathon is this very very famous uh not just alaska famous which is like a much lower bar um like worldwide famous race up this crazy I mean, like, I've talked to you guys about how steep trails are here and how Alaskans don't believe in switchbacks. Nowhere is that more true than on Mount Marathon. Um, It goes straight up this mountain of 3,022 feet, right, Max? Yeah, I think they resurveyed yeah. it. It's actually like uh, 3,000 yeah. something, but we made a film that was called 3,022. So I'll like yeah. deny that. Yeah, we'll the go end. with that. And everyone's <laughs> stickers say 3,022. So we're just going to keep with the sticker street cred. Um, <laughs> it goes straight up this mountain. The race is a 5K from downtown Seward, which if you've ever um, considered a cruise into Alaska or taken a cruise into Alaska, you might have gone through Seward. It's like the last stop on the cruise uh, before you turn around and head back to the lower 48. Um, and uh, this race goes 5k starts downtown runs up this mountain and back down again uh and it is like uh scree which is like um a very slidey rock uh you essentially go up this mountain as fast as you can and then fall down it that's that's what it is um i've never done it that was a kind way to call scree scree is scree is like if if like black slate and a knife had a love child (laughs) And like the mountain is just full of it. And you just like, like you scrape your way up it. And then you just like, basically, I mean, it's not even falling. You like roll your way down. And then like, there's a waterfall. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah, I like what you said that Alaska's like bar for fame is like lower, but I kind of think it's the other way around. Like our bar for Alaska (laughs) famous is lower, but like our bar for Alaska, like for craziness is so, so so high. And Alaskans think Mount Marathon is crazy. If that gives like any sense of just this race. Totally. So then the Iditarod National Historic Trail is the trail that they would have taken from Seward to uh, Nome on the famous Iditarod run, right? That's the that's the idea. Well, kind of. And I'm just rediscovering all of this myself. I mean, uh, you know, like talk about the what you can learn if you actually go outside on stuff. So everybody knows the story of the Iditarod, right? It's like all these kids got sick. So they like, you know, brought like the serum, which is very pertinent right now to Nome. And then the kids didn't get sick. But then like, well, actually, a lot of them died. But like, um, yes, <laughs> it gets dark. But then if you actually like pick it apart, it's like three totally different things. It's wild. Yeah. So you've got like the... Iditarod Trail is actually uh, just goes to Iditarod, which is a town, not known. And it was basically a mail route from Seward to Iditarod for all these gold miners to basically send mail and gold back. It was 1910, which was uh, the the Iditarod race actually started in 1970. <laughs> and the serum run, which is what everybody thinks about on this, uh, you know, of what started this was... Uh, was a run from Nanana to Nome, which wasn't even on, like didn't even touch the Iditarod Trail, right. really. And so Dan Seavey and these others started the race on uh, in 1970. So it's these three totally different things, each their own wild, insane, huge, wild, crazy story that you could like make decades of films about. Um, and then people just kind of lump them together in Alaska. And I, I think that's yeah. what people don't realize about, especially like Alaska is they'd like, Oh, well, there's got some good mountains and some big trails, but like, so do the Alps, you know, in France. Yeah. But what they don't realize is that like Alaskan mountain ranges could eat the Alps or that there are even Alpses in Alaska mountain ranges that nobody has even seen. There's just not enough people up here to like explore them. We know the Alps cause there's cities all around them. Like right. there are, there are ranges in Alaska so huge that they make the Alps and like the Rockies look like nothing. And there's just, you know, maybe one cabin at the base of one of them. It's just a scale well, you that you can't fly even fly into. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're lucky, yeah. if you're lucky, if like there's a weather window, you might be able to fly into. <laughs> right. Exactly. I had so, no idea. Coming out of sewer, Johnson Pass is a part of that trail, that historic trail, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. so I, I bring that up because some people listening to this might have 
seen pictures of my friends and I running on Johnson Pass last summer before I hurt myself uh, and stopped running. Uh, yeah, so it, yeah. that was super fun. Uh, so just like packaging it up for people listening to this who have never been here, you have probably seen picture portions of this. And finally, uh, in Nome, you are working with uh, Carol Seplu, who was on the podcast in season two. Um, oh, yeah. talking about mental health. So we've talked to Carol before and we're familiar with her story. And uh, she's she described running in Nome for us a little bit and what that's like. So it's oh, uh, Carol all is such with a, a bow. <laughs> such a cool runner too. I mean, like, I mean, her her ability to keep on going on a lot of these trails is amazing. Like I consider myself a pretty solid runner. Um, but yeah. when she was running these roads, I mean, she was running like basically back to back hundred milers. And after the first road and these whole, like brutal winds and temperatures and just like, it was, it was really tough going. And then Tim and I who are running with her are basically like, I think we need to not do that again for like several years. And Carol's <laughs> like, okay, yes, I agree. And then the next day she's like, so we're doing the next one next week. Is that right? And then she did it. And we basically just sat yeah. in the car and watched and she did it. Um, so I, I mean, just in case anybody has not heard Carol Seplu's episode in season <laughs> two, I think you really, really should. And here's why. What Max just described, um, that's badass. No doubt. It's even more badass when you learn that Carol runs with a tracheotomy. Uh, and so um, she sur- is a suicide attempt survivor. Um, and to survive that, the doctors had to give her tracheotomy, which means that she essentially breathes through a tube in her neck. Uh, and she runs in very cold temperatures, by the way. And guess what tends to ice up in that? It's uh, it's really incredible. I mean, just makes everybody else look like they're taking a nap. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, like Carol's Carol's got some amazing, like amazing obstacles that she's overcome. But then also just, I mean, like all of that aside, the reason she runs, what makes yes. it difficult. I mean, she's just putting in some serious miles for like she running is. up there. It's it's wild. And so the hope here is to uh, run this final trail, the Serum Run route. So we'll go from Anchorage to Nanana, part part way by train, um, and then Nanana to Nome is the 674 mile journey uh, in winter, where it gets sometimes to about negative 55 without wind chill, um, and be able to kind of trek through these trails, and then I'll meet up with Carol um, in White Mountain, and then we're going to run 70 miles to Nome to kind of finish it off. Is the so is the plan, and then hopefully be able to tie this wild thing together this string of a watercolor basically and using these watercolors to kind of fill in the pieces that aren't there and talk about the ways that the the trails have really affected alaska and uh you know public health and then also you know the history the deep deep history that we rarely realize in alaska we almost pretend like alaska started um started with the pioneers and, and so often i mean you know it's as if alaska started 100 years ago but but i'm just learning myself that i mean alaska has had this rich culture for for 10,000 years basically and if you want to talk about endurance athletes i mean some some of the people that lived here and the feats that they would do and the way that they would work off the landscape and how it affected what they were able to do is just absolutely incredible and so i'm so looking forward to learning more and actually kind of connecting with this landscape through the feet uh, as well as the paintbrush because yeah. uh, it's just yeah it's it's such a unique place and you you feel it like from the second you step off a plane or a boat here it's just it is such a unique spot so we've been talking a little bit about creativity about a little bit about alaska i want to go back to creativity um mm-hmm. before we tie this all up uh when you and I were talking earlier, you said something about anybody being able to practice their way into being able to draw. I don't know that that's true. I, for example, draw so poorly that being on a team with me playing Pictionary is a pun, like an actual punishment for me. <laughs> okay. I drew a dolphin a couple weeks ago and people thought it was a turtle. And I surveyed my Instagram friends and they also thought it was a turtle. Like it was not like that was the best guess scenario. It was not good. Okay. Oh. Like I couldn't remember what it looks like. I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay. So do you think that going out, like, obviously you, there's talent and then there's learning, right? Those are two different things. Um, do you think that heading outside can help people tap a creativity uh, 
and not necessarily not necessarily a talent, but like that creativity side of you. Tap that in a way that maybe staying inside or an indoor pursuit can't. That's a good question. I definitely well, I should I should let you know that being on a team with me for Pictionary is also a punishment because <laughs> It takes so long. They're like, the time has been up for two minutes. What are you drawing? And I'm like, well, this is the tip of the dolphin's tail. And they're like, okay, all right. But like, we can't guess because we lost. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think that kind of gets to it is that like a lot of this just takes a long time. I mean, mm. art takes a long time. When you see these big, big, big fancy pictures, I mean, they took a lot of time to paint. And if you see a time lapse of one of these beautiful watercolors, just like it seems like they make this landscape in two strokes of a brush and it's just so perfect. That's because they've done that 30,000 times over the course of 15 years. Um, so the time element is really something that it's hard to see and really easy to kind of count yourself out because of it. And so often people will maybe draw and sketch because it's just everybody's an artist when you're a kid. Nobody, Nobody's not creative. Nobody's not a painter. It's just who you are. And then oftentimes people stop painting around nine or maybe 12. And then maybe they'll pick it back up when they're 22 or 19, but it looks like a nine-year-old or a 12-year-old drew that because that's kind of when they stopped. And so what I try to encourage people is just like, keep keep with it, just keep with it because it's going to take some time. But sometimes all it takes is, is uh, you know, a week or two or three weeks until you really kind of get hooked. And then a year goes by and all of a sudden you're a pretty good painter. And then two years go by and you're a really good painter. Just looking at the work, I've got sketchbooks just like hundreds hundreds and hundreds of sketchbooks and just looking at the work and how much i've changed in the last five years is amazing in the last two years in fact is even incredible and it just whatever gets you into that is what counts you're asking if you know being outside can can help people with that creativity side and 100 percent because if you're outside and you're you're sketching something you're excited to be there you're excited to capture it that will get you sketching more and that's going to make you a better painter, better artist. And whether it's painting mountains or, you know, painting self portraits in mountains, whatever it is that can get you out and get you painting is going to make you a better, you know, a, a better painter. And I know there's a lot of people that say, I can never paint or I can never do that, but you'd be absolutely shocked what you can do if you take a deep breath and lower your expectations and then just, you know, <laughs> get just, just, uh, just keep on working. I, I can't draw faces to save my life. That's the thing that scares me the most, but, uh, or even people, frankly, like all the people in my paintings are these tiny little backwards exclamation points because, uh, you know, <laughs> that's, that's about the level I'm at but I can paint mountains and I love it. And so you don't, you don't need to be a classic Renaissance painter to be a good painter. You just need to be having fun. That's what counts. Um, so what I hear you saying is that it, like from a how to perspective, this is like, it's not osmosis, right? Like I'm not going to go outside and be like mountains speak to me and I will become a beautiful you know, artist. It's practice. Like take the sketchbook, give it a try, then do oh, it again. Yeah most like I, I choke up in the mountains honestly the the more beautiful it is the worse my sketch oftentimes i get to like these gorgeous spots and i get so intimidated by how beautiful they are and how how shoddy my sketch is gonna look compared to the view that i just like leave it in my backpack i, I would say 90 percent of the sketches i make are from like boring views because they are less intimidating and almost all of the times that my sketchbook just stays in the backpack is when it's really 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 beautiful but it, whatever it takes to kind of get out there and do it. And in fact, the pandemic is an awesome opportunity to just get painting. And that's yeah. something that uh, some artists and I, Jill Ritchie, who's one of them, she's a really good painter in Fairbanks. Um, Claire Giordano, she's a really good painter in Seattle. We were like, how can we do something that encourages people to, to stay positive in some pretty rough times when a lot of people can't get outside? And we've started this thing called homebound sketches on Instagram, as opposed to trailbound sketches, which is my account. And so the idea is that we're just going to give people a prompt every single week or well, five prompts a week. And then, uh, you know, they, they just kind of like have this community and then we give little giveaways and stuff. But um, what it really takes is just practice. And, and you should get all your mistakes done here instead of after you hike up a giant, huge mountain and get frustrated because, <laughs> uh, you know, you're cold and tired and wet and you have one hour to make a painting and, a, and it messed up. Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
this has been so so fun i could talk to you forever uh i think i say that at the end of every podcast i do though so <laughs> that's just how it goes i guess when you're <laughs> pursuing like interviewing people yeah so okay so we do a little leftovers round at the end because I, I just like to know some stuff uh some practical mm. things from our guests so can you tell us uh what is your favorite piece of outdoor gear what is something that is like your favorite Oh man. Okay. Can I do favorite piece of outdoor gear and then favorite piece of art gear? Cause I feel like those are yes. almost connected, but not okay. Favorite piece of outdoor gear is like, <laughs> it's like those jackets that have pockets. Like I, I love the pockets that are on the front, like this, like a nice little zip up hoodie or something with like the pockets, like right on the front. It's just t- game changer. You can put anything in there, like sketchbook, <laughs> sketchpad, like goo, like that's all you need is just like jacket pockets. Oh, it's the best. Um, I have one and I just kind of wear it to death. It's kind of lame, but it's like, boy, that is just my favorite piece of outdoor gear. And as far as like, uh, as far as painting goes, I think my favorite piece of outdoor gear is these little tiny travel palettes. Um, they are the art toolkit makes a really good one. I've got one from my grandmother uh, as well. And it just, they're these tiny little palettes. They're very small. They destroy your excuse to be able to take things anywhere. And you can use them like a little water brush, which are really useful. Um, and just uh, honestly, just having something small and like compact like that, like I've, I've got one here and just like being able to to paint anywhere is is such a gift. What is your most essential piece of outdoor gear? Most My most essential, essential piece like, of outdoor You can't gear? live without this. Maybe, maybe it is the watercolor. Um, the art gear you just mentioned? That's a good question. I think, I mean, like, it would be lame to say just a backpack, but yeah. a backpack is pretty incredible. I mean, just, yeah, you know, good, it's I mean, a good backpack is a, game, is a game changer, right? Like, one mm-hmm. that fits poorly, zero stars, negative stars. Yeah. <laughs> one that fits well, like, life changing. Or just like a small vest too. I mean, like a small vest, a small backpack uh, for running, especially. I guess those vests mm-hmm. that you can put on, they they really kind of changed things for me because all of a sudden I could carry these sketchbooks with me. And I'd say as far as like, I couldn't live without too, it'd be like a little sketchbook because um, it changes your perspective on things because a big one is intimidating and you got to spend a lot of time, but it's not hard to make a pretty solid tiny painting. And so like, mentally and physically a tiny little sketchbook absolutely is a game changer for me and i i don't think i could live without them but yeah little backpack little sketchbook they they do the trick i i mean you mentioned solomon earlier i love the their advanced skin 12 um yeah because yeah, that sucker fits probably more stuff than you really should have with you and <laughs> yeah and um and it just like it is like a second skin it's just super super comfortable and um now you have all of the snacks in the land and probably the extra jacket you didn't really need. So <laughs> yeah, it's like a weight training at that point. For me, it's like yeah. always like, yeah, those, those, they fit so much. And then it's like, well, maybe I need a camera and another sketchbook and then this and a painting and a pen. And like, yeah, it's, it's uh, basically a small art store on my back. Yeah. <laughs> now you're essentially heading up the mountain with like a roller suitcase. It's over. So <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a gateway drug. Really. <laughs> all right. Final, final thing, last but not least, um, if you were going to describe for us your ideal outdoor moment or your favorite outdoor moment, like when you close your eyes and like think of that happy out, that happy place outside, where are you and what are you doing? Um, I think I'm in France. I'm on a little kind of like unknown hill that we had no idea about. And it's where my wife and I got engaged a couple of years ago. And It was an absolutely perfect day. It wasn't anything fancy or like glitzy. We just went to like a supermarket because we're like, I lost my wallet. So I think we had like basically no money (laughs) and we got like some like cheap, like little sausages and like some cheap little things. And then I actually borrowed her card and secretly got some cheap champagne. And uh, I proposed to her with like a little like ring made out of grass um, with a like promise to get a fancier one. And it was just like one of those days where like everything was perfect and like the you know including the company and uh yeah it's it's so wonderful to be able to share moments like that with with the landscape and i feel like it really gave back as well so that's when i when i blink that's that's what's on my eyelids max thank you so much for joining us on the humans outside podcast today thanks so much for having me this was awesome i feel like i learn more every time i i share about this and i'm so excited to kind of get back to sketching now i feel even more inspired